So uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I did notice, I think it was Jim was telling me about 50% of the folks are new this year. So for those of you that haven't seen me, I share in your disappointment. <laughs> but um, my actual title is Cybersecurity Advisor for Research Infrastructure. And just to give you a sense of where I sit at NSF, I sit in the office of the Chief Officer for Research Facility. And uh, my boss is the one that has the responsibility for the major facilities, which are those that cost more than $100 million, and the large mid-scales as well. Um, so I was hired as a result of a report. NSF um, sponsored the JSONs to do a report on cybersecurity a couple of years ago. And one of the recommendations was go ahead and hire somebody to be responsible for cybersecurity. The goal is really of my position is to review the, the NSF posture towards cybersecurity and raise the bar. At the same time, we've been told, um, and part of this is tradition, although tradition is just peer pressure from dead people, so we'll have to play with this over time, not to be overly prescriptive. So I've been reviewing the um, the policy, the bureaucratic framework around NSF awards. And um, one of the main things, and this is what I really want to talk to you folks about, is we've been working on the guidance that we give major facilities. So those of you that aren't with major facilities, I apologize. That's sort of where I'm targeting today. But let me go ahead and get started. Oops, come on. There we go. Let me talk a little bit about our approach to cybersecurity. Um, and again, a lot of this is, uh, it's really easy to say, oh, this is Mike's approach. This is the way NSF views things. Um, I don't work in a vacuum. I talk to a lot of people. I talk to some of you. Um, I hope to talk to more of you. Uh, but as it says here, we are not prescriptive. The major facilities with a few sort of edge cases are not run on government networks. They're not run, uh, they're not government facilities. And um, the responsibility for securing those is really not NSF's. It is the awardee's responsibility to secure the facility. And it's been an interesting lesson for me as I've been reviewing all the various major um, facility awards is I keep looking for the language in those awards that say, this is how you must secure the facility. And there really is very little out there. It basically says, knock yourself out do a good job. Um, but at the same time, we are obligated to oversee the awards. And as you guys all know, when we build, uh, when you're building a facility, there's an enormous overhead around construction, financial management, and we're going to have to start doing more of that around cybersecurity. Now, some of the uh, pr principles that we've got in mind here that are sort of informing how we're approaching this is we don't expect cybersecurity to be a static thing. It's not one thing you do and then you're done. If you're doing cybersecurity at your facility five years from now, the way you're doing it today, you're not doing something right, most likely. Um, we also want to start seeing more of a programmatic approach where you've got a security program, not just a few technical controls that you're worrying about. And the other thing that's important to keep in mind when we talk about this is this vital national assets issue. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but in the eyes of the federal government, these major facilities are considered critical infrastructure. And that has to play a factor in mind and it addresses, sort of tells you a little bit about what happens when there's a problem at a facility, the kind of people in the government that take interest in this. Um, but there's one thing, and you'll hear, hear me say this many times throughout today, to have a successful cybersecurity program, we at NSF believe you need the leadership for the facility engaged in that program. Now, those of you that are cybersecurity folks, you get this, you know this. Those of you that are maybe facilities management may not be thinking about this. But personally, what I would like to see is that those of you that are leads for security programs, you're at the big table you're at the leadership meetings, you may, need to, may not need to vote on how construction goes or anything, but you need to be there, you need a chance to speak directly in an unfiltered way to the leadership of these programs, if the security program is gonna be. And then of course, NSF needs enough information about what you're doing 
that we can do our own due diligence and oversight. So what I'll show you uh, here in the next couple of minutes is sort of our tactic for how we're achieving these things. There we go. I do wanna say one thing though that I think is really critical and this gets lost on leadership a lot. People feel if you have a compromise at your facility, you must have failed. No, this is 2023. If, <laughs> if you're not having some problems, some systems, some account, you, you must be air gapped in, in the bottom of a cave somewhere where no one can see you. Everyone gets compromised to some degree. It's just the reality. And so what we're shooting for is not perfect, you know, uh, systems and a program where nothing ever goes wrong. What we want is you to be resilient for when it goes wrong. And the way I've tried to describe, describe this here is you want to focus on not doing, not shooting yourself in the foot. Make sure the stupid stuff doesn't get you. That's fairly easy and straightforward. But when the more sophisticated attacks come along, you want to be able to contain it so it doesn't um, spread throughout your facility. I hate to see a situation where someone has one machine get ransomware or one machine account get compromised and you need to reimage a thousand systems. That's just not the world we want to be in. And the goal here, of course, is to protect the operations of the facility, business continuity, if you will, uh, the continuity of science, maybe by a better way to say that. Um, Remember, these facilities cost half a billion dollars to build, 40 to $100 million annually to run. If a facility is not running for a month, two months, three months, somebody somewhere is going, that's $100,000 a day. Now, it's not cash loss. But that's the way these things tend to get viewed. And of course, you heard Rob talk about reproducibility. We have to make sure that the scientific artifacts are uh, protected. So I'm gonna keep saying this to your leadership. I'm gonna keep saying this within NSF. It's, it falls on deaf ears when there's a problem because people just get angry, but this is the attitude that we're trying to take around this. Uh, so some forthcoming guidance, what we're working on right now. The key place is most of you know that NSF provides guidance on how to do cybersecurity is in the research infrastructure guide. That's getting a major revamp. And I've talked to a lot of you about what you want to see in the rig. And you want clarity. You want crisp explanations of what's expected and how to achieve it and how we're going to review what you're doing. Um, I'd like to see cybersecurity elevated to a first class concern so that leadership again is involved. It's not, oh, some middle manager underneath the IT director, underneath the cybersecurity. Uh, infrastructure director underneath the um, head of technology is, is worrying about it. No, I want to make sure that, again, it's 2023. Cybersecurity is driven by geopolitics, frankly. I want to make sure that your leadership is aware that this is something they have to worry about the same way they worry about any other major risk to a facility. And again, I'm trying to clarify what we're asking for and the detail about what we're asking for so that we can do due diligence here. So a few themes, you'll see me repeat these over and over again that you'll see in the rig. Now, again, my caveat here is that everything is draft, planned. Part of why I'm excited to be here is I want you to come up to me or email me and tell me what you like and don't like about the rig, what would be helpful to you. Um, as I think Rob mentioned, there's an enormous amount of vetting and socialization and checks and balances before anything gets published. So we're in a very early stage actually in the rig. What I am pushing for is that we start asking for three pieces of documentation um, from each of the major facilities and the mid scales. First, a cyber risk register. Now, I'll be honest, I have not been a big fan of risk registers in general. Um, for most of my career. The problem is regis risk registers tend to be sometimes too granular. And so what I'm trying to do here, and you'll see some suggestions around this in the rig, is to keep it fairly simple, keep it high level, but use the risk register to drive your resource requests. So I see a risk register as having three components, those 
uh, strategic risks, the ones that really put you at risk. And I have compliance with NIST POM 33 on there. If you're not compliant with NIST POM 33 and there's only 12 basic hygiene controls, 10 or 12, 13, whatever it is, um, you can't get federal funding, period. So they're kind of important. Um, I believe it's a good thing on a risk register to call out this what I call the exigent risks. These are the things that are kind of trendy and in the newspaper and require a whole portfolio of controls to address. Ransomware, supply chain would be two good examples. And I also think that all of you are, should have picked by now a standard you're building your program around, whether it's using the trusted CI framework, whether it's using one of the NIST standards. Frankly, we're not gonna tell you which one uh, to pick, but you gotta write down what it is and you should identify the gaps in your risk register between that standard and where you are today. And those gaps and those other items should have mitigations associated with them. Those mitigations should have either risk acceptance or resources associated with them. So the whole idea here is to be risk driven. Uh, next, I'm pushing that we start asking for a cybersecurity budget. Nobody has one as far as I can tell. What everyone does is we've got, uh, we have a uh, cyber infrastructure budget, which means we have an IT budget and Ralph here does 10% of his time and Alice does 20% of her time on security. Now we want a budget where you list the staff doing cybersecurity, even if it's partial, how much you're spending on cybersecurity, how much you're planning on spending on cybersecurity. And there's at one level, I think this is very important, but I, I also think the critical thing about this is the thought process that has to take place between you and your leadership as you put this together. Because it's easy to say, oh, we got IT people that take care of it. But when they do the math and go, well, we actually have 10% of one person that does cybersecurity, that's a different conversation. And then the last piece on here, I call the information assurance management plan. I don't really care what you call it. Let me show you what that amounts to. The IAMP is a master document that describes your security program. It is not a compilation of 80 pages of policies and procedures. It is the management document you use to describe the entirety of your cybersecurity program. Now I've used the term information assurance because I'm trying to, I find that when I talk to security professionals, they understand this. They understand the breadth of information security. When I talk to management, Cybersecurity means, oh, the people that employ anti-malware or make me use a two-factor. They don't understand that it includes looking at your data management plans, that it includes business continuity. They, the, the breadth of that is lost on non-professionals. So I've broadened it. You can see the definition I'm using for information assurance. I'm trying, I'm proposing that we propagate this throughout the rig, but you can see the sort of recommended structure for an IAMP. I don't have religion on this particular one. This is the way I tend to think about this. And when I talk to people, I find useful. You may find it, for example, I have this section baseline security functions. And that's where you list, what are the functions of your security office? What do they do? And I'm not talking pages. I'm talking a few sentences or paragraph on each one of these. Um, you may find that it's better to just combine programmatic processes, which are big program processes, with your function, you may want to sort of restructure this, what works for you, tailor it to your environment. I'm fine with that, but I use this as a model for you to start with. And um, by the way, in terms of scale and size, I imagine this for even a major facility being a eight to 10 page document top. We're not talking um, a tome, all right? I do want to say one quick word about the risk treatment plans. This is a term of art that I've used in my previous job. And what I've used it for is to describe, again, things like ransomware or a summary of how I protect my uh, 100 gig and 400 gig networks, because it's difficult for something like that that has a whole sort of, again, small portfolio of controls to be described just in a list of controls. I find that with a document that says, this is how we tackle ransomware, 
I can beat my management around the head with it and go, here's the answer, because all they do is read ransomware in the newspaper. So risk treatment plans are, again, just another optional thing that I find very handy uh, to use in working with my management. Now, I want to change gears briefly, and this is where I really want to start getting some feedback from you all. I want to give you some um, uh, framing of sort of how this all plays out within the NSF world. So as I have said earlier, the facilities are not um, run by NSF, but they are viewed nationally as critical infrastructure. And they do play a big role in our competitiveness as a country when it comes to science and our reputation. But uh, what do, despite all this, when something goes wrong at a major facility, we get calls. We get calls from the press going, I heard that you had a problem at one of your facilities. Uh, we have other agencies call and go, hey, we had a problem at this facility. What are you doing about it? Um, we get calls from the executive offices of the government going, how did you let this happen? And all of that means is that we get incredible pressure to be more prescriptive. And I don't want us to be more prescriptive. I don't want to be an auditor. And so the problem that I want to point out is this kicks in, and thank you, Anurag, if you're here for continuing to allow me to use the slide now for about six years. Um, this is what happens. The researchers get these regulations. They don't know how to deal with them. They don't know how to do security. They get compromised and the sponsors in the government say, well, you need more regulations. And we're back to the beginning. This is the cycle we live in today for most research. And this is what we're trying to avoid. So for me, what I did when I started at NSF and started looking into this problem is I took a look at what documents I could find about incidents that took place at major facilities. And I don't have great documentation. Sometimes you've just got almost an email thread. Other times you've got a report. So what I'm listing here is not the result of a detailed data-driven analysis. It's me reading through what I could find and making some observations. And what I noticed is that in response to incidents, facilities are doing pretty much the same thing. Now, this isn't 100% complete. Some of you that have, if you talk to trusted CI, they'll pick out a few other things that I've missed. Um, but this is the list of controls that tend to get shoved into place after a major incident. Uh, suddenly, they've got the ability to do multi-factor everywhere, not just on privileged accounts. Uh, network segmentation happens a lot because that's the only way to control the blast radius. Um, you find that suddenly they get much more rigorous about their hardening and configuration management, these privilege. Uh, you can just go through the whole list here. What's interesting about these, in my mind, when I looked at this, is there's nothing rocket science on here. There's nothing particularly clever about these. These are kind of basic hygiene. Now, it's not to say they're easy. Doing network segmentation in a complex, large network is a lot of work. You can screw things up pretty easily. But um, what I was struck by was how fundamental this is. So the question I've got for you, and I would love to hear a little more, uh, I think this is, next one is my last slide, is how do we get to a position as a community where we start putting these kinds of controls into place before you have a crisis? Because we talked, I talked earlier about how to avoid the vicious cycle. To me, the way to avoid the vicious cycle is not to eliminate incidents, but to eliminate the, the, the breadth and impact of these incidents uh, so that we don't have facilities shut down. If, if a facility has a major incident and they're back in business in three days, that's a success story we should be bragging about, not, oh my God, we, we were shut down for two months or three months or six months. So to me, the real question is, and this is, I want to know what the challenge is, because I know all of you are doing these things to some degree, but how do we turn the corner as a community at the big facilities and get these in place before there's a problem? So my last slide is just feel free to reach out to me, feel free to contact me. 
One thing I do want to say is if you uh, do reach out to me, CC your program officer. I want to make sure we don't end up with multiple lines of communication between NSF and the facility. But with that, I'll use whatever time I have left. I haven't been watching the <laughs> clock. Um, oh, it's right there. I got five minutes left. I, I wish I'd seen that earlier. Um, take some questions. Go ahead. Um, Thank you. What made them so we exist within uh, either one or more existing organizational structures, basically the Department of University, the Fed, and so on? My belief from the outside is that they're still largely going to do what they're on silos, so they're building a lot of their own infrastructure. So the question is uh, my assumption is why the facility exists within or have ties to the university that sponsors these lead on projects and stuff, but do you find that they exist within their own infrastructural, infrastructural silo that they are implementing a lot of the security controls on their own as opposed to trying to leverage more of the economy of scale by time stuff that they exist in campus or university or other organizational stuff? So um, there is the gap you are to get rid of these different groups. So uh, anything you want to Yeah, um, I, I think part of what I think makes it a challenge to answering that question is that the heterogeneity of the 18 or 19 major facilities is all over the map. You've got standalone centers. You've got some that are part of a university, kind of. But I'll tell you, uh, having been a CISO at a major institution, my teams were ill, excellent teams, ill-prepared to run a HPC security shop or... Um, you know, look <clears throat> look at some of the big ones like the um, academic research fleet or Neon, any of these sort of large distributed ones. The, the, they're kind of forced into a siloization. And remember, they're also funding security in a siloed way through the, through the award. So I, I agree with you. It would be nice to see more leveraging existing tool sets, so to speak, and capabilities. But it's challenging and really specific to the facility, I think. <laughs> it's coming down. Kind of. CISA gets involved. CISA has them on the list, has research and development and the facilities down as critical infrastructure. Now, they're not critical infrastructure in, say, the way the water supply of Los Angeles is critical infrastructure, right? But um, the, the degree to which our research engine, if you will, plays a role in national um, reputation and uh, economic impact, Absolutely, it's viewed as critical infrastructure. Now, it's true, because uh, I've been looking at sort of the, the risk profile of the portfolio, the life safety issues are really small. A uh, facility could be hit by a meteor, and it's going to be smaller, fewer people injured than a bus crash downtown. Mm -hmm. But having said that, there is this out, what's the word, out, um, this, this massive impact on reputation. People look at the U.S. and our science as world leading. So I think that's really the direction this comes from, or the role this comes from. And, you know, one of the things that I did want to mention that I think I skipped over is that as we keep talking about um, um, trying to be non-prescriptive, the federal government is getting increasingly prescriptive around cybersecurity. So... I'm not planning any effort to put any prescriptive standards in the rig in the near future. But I have to be honest, I think three to five years, this may be out of our hands. So this is why I think we really need to just look hard at what are our benchmarks? What are we striving for? Um, and start working toward it, because I think it's coming slowly but surely. And I only have 20 seconds left, so. Corner me if there's one more question, if not, just corner. Oh, there's one last question, and then I'll shut up. Thank you so much.
Thank you. So I know of no specific things. I should let the program officers describe. Maybe there's future solicitations along these lines, but you've hit on a huge problem in cybersecurity. Um, most CISOs operate and are viewed as directors of security operations. And that's fine. That's important. Don't get me wrong. But these larger programmatic views, um, it's a skill set that many of us don't have. And it, it's a it's a challenge, you know. Many of the people that I think I have a lot of respect for and are excellent CISOs, I wouldn't want them talking to my board or my chancellor because they're going to talk about patching, and that's not what we should be talking about, not with leadership. So, thank you. <laughs>